Linda, thank you so much for joining me. We're talking about redefining leadership in the new normal. The pandemic has given us a great opportunity to stop, recheck, and relaunch leadership. What have you done from your perspective? Firstly, thank you, Brahman, for actually having me uh, with you here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot that's been done. I mean, for me personally, first, it was around how do I lead myself through change before I even can think about my team and work and so on. So, I mean, there are different things that have changed in me. My trust quotient, I think, has gone up like tenfold. My ability to actually live with uncertainty has increased. My consciousness and intentionality around being an inspirational leader actually also has increased tenfold in the last kind of few months. Let's talk about your trust quotient because that is actually the key factor here. In a mm -hmm. virtual world where you don't have people present and under your nose on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to trust that the people that you've employed will in fact deliver on their, their goals and their performance requirements. Has it been difficult? I must be honest, initially, it was really, really difficult. Now it's more a way of life, right? We actually have accepted that there would be a hybrid way of working. So if someone asks me, for example, what is the one defining thing that you think that uh, COVID has done, right? It has actually moved us to actually being in the position, more than technology, in a position to trust people more to actually be able to rely on people more. When people say, I'm gonna do it, not to have to double check that they're gonna do it, but rather trust that they're gonna do it. So from a work environment going forward, I think that bodes well for collaboration, for actually coming up with new innovation as we actually move into this new era. What is the detail around MTN's new flexible working hour policy? Yeah, MTN is looking at obviously work from anywhere, and, and work anytime. So this actually recognizes that there are lessons learned from being in this uh, pandemic. And what are the big lessons that I learned? That people can be productive without a boss or a manager looking and breathing down their necks. People can self-manage. People actually want the best outcome for a business. So what we're doing now is saying to everybody, there are times when you can work away from the office just synchronize it with your teams or with your leaders so that you can still have effective teams. This is important, Bronner, because for us, I mean, it's sort of saying, you know, we know that you are, you are more productive working from home, right? When you work up by yourself, you actually are doing a lot more than what you were doing uh, at, at the office because there's no walking around, there's none of that, and you just get on with the work. However, it is not great for building team dynamics. It is not great for actually fostering collaboration. It is not great for actually ensuring that that trust quotient actually is, uh, is actually increased. So when you're in a crisis, you actually don't know how your colleagues will actually react, right? So now that becomes a new uh, level of anxiety for an organization or for a team. So it's important that we also spend some time together. And that's why the sort of hybrid model is actually important. Let's investigate the, the hybrid model because there's also the relative clumsiness of, of hybrid when some are in the boardroom, some are off site, and you are dealing with the dynamic of face to face and virtual. Has that been something that you need to adjust to? Yes, I mean, I'll tell you what normally happens. So this happened to me twice, and that's when I, I realized that actually trying to get the team either all in at more or less the same time or all out at the same time is much better. So what happened, is, what tends then to happen in the two meetings that I had where I thought this was dysfunctional is that we had a couple of people in the room and we had two people that were actually virtual, right? And what, we, what you see is that the people in the room are reading each other's body language. They're reading each other and they're feeding off each other's energy and so on. And the people on the other side virtually are actually being left behind. So obviously you either do training first and say, okay guys, when you are in this environment, this is how you deal with it, right? And then, or alternatively you say, guys, how do we try to ensure that when we have team meetings and all these kinds of issues, we are together and physically in the same space. 
MTN is a huge organization. So if you are managing to write an effective standard operating procedure on working through this new normal, I'm sure it will be used as a benchmark across the board. What have been some of the biggest challenges that you personally have, have faced? In your capacity, it's leading from home. So firstly, I mean, you know, you actually in this new normal have to lead in terms of your family, right? I've got kids and I have to deal with that first, right? And how do you ensure that now you are able to actually create space for them? Because now they're used to you being at home. When I go to work now, my kids ask me, what time are you going to come back? This was never a question before, right? Uh, and because they're used to actually leaving you in, at, the, at the house and coming back with you still at the house. So they see you in the study when they leave, they see you in the study when they come back. So all those kind of stuff and, to, and actually managing their transition as I manage mine. And then the second part from a leadership and a work perspective is how do we ensure that we remain engaged? So what are the little things that we do? Is it like the coffee with Yolanda? So where people can actually talk to me on a more casual basis and say, I've got these fears, I've got these kind of uh, anxieties and so on. So the empathetic leader actually comes out in this, uh, in this environment. And I have learned to actually be quite deliberate again. As I said, initially I told you that I, I actually am using sort of this inspirational leader kind of framework for me to be able to, to, uh, to, to, to lead in this, in this space. So what does that mean in reality? It means my empathy actually goes up significantly, right? It means that um, my sort of how I look at competence of people actually now has to be flexible, right? And I have to understand that people are living with anxieties every day and there's ambiguity in terms of, because there is also a transition that we're going through as MTN, how am I making sure that people are comfortable uh, with that, right? Because some people tend to be quite anxious when there's a lot of change happening and so on. And basically, how do you give people comfort even in that? And then, and, and lastly, how do we make sure that we invest for the best? How do we actually, in, in, within an MTN context, we say um, we've got an HR kind of framework that is uh, inspired living. Right, and, and in, in, in terms of that inspired living, we have key pillars where people are actually able, being able to learn, able to engage, um, able to give back, able to do different things. And that really talks to the whole person, the complete kind of employee value proposition that we want to actually deliver to everyone. The key underpin here is technology and yes. embracing technology, including artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, Web3. This is talking to your book. I mean, this is what yes. you live, eat and breathe. And yes. surely that is also defining leadership, is the ability to, as a leader, I use the term collaborate mm. with technology mm. to create the best outcome for your organization. And for me, technology is an enabler, right? as an enabler of what you are thinking about as a leader, how you live through your own mind to say, what is the art of the possible? And, and I guess as, uh, as a technology company, we start with what is the art of the possible? What is driving us every morning to come to work? And the first thing that drives us to come to work is that we are actually changing the world. We are saying everyone deserves the benefit of a modern connected life. So we come to, to work saying, which digital solutions are we designing? Which uh, digital solutions are we facilitating, collaborating on in order to make Africa progress? And for me, I mean, in fact, one of my, my business card actually says that. It says, I'm a chief champion for progress in, in the Southern and Eastern African region, right? And, and that's what actually gets us going. And it is not uh, big solutions that get us there. It is being flexible in our thought process that actually gets us there. Just from personal experience, we have connected with 36 plus countries across the world over this COVID-19 period and operated very effective sessions, sometimes two hours into Sierra Leone, into the Gambia, into Cameroon. Previously, 
that would have taken me, if I look at 36 countries, it would have taken me three years as a minimum to execute getting to all of those territories. Mm. And now I go to what Bill Gates said. He said that basically in a post-COVID-19 world, 50% of the pre-COVID-19 business travel would not come back online. And I just see it in my own business. You, of course, spend a lot of time pre-COVID on a plane. What's it like today? Uh, it has significantly decreased, right? Right now, our stakeholders, governments, everybody is actually comfortable to have some of the discussions online, which was never the case, right? I mean, if I wanted to discuss one issue with, uh, with an official, I actually had to fly from Johannesburg to wherever that country is. Sometimes now, off the continent, then back onto the continent that, with logistics. Absolutely, absolutely right. Um, so we, we actually had to do that. However, I mean, you know, you still have the teams on the ground, right? And the teams on the ground do a fair amount of, of, of the work as well. So, so for me, if I look at um, just overall business travel, I mean, that has uh, most probably actually halved, at least, at least. And you won't go back to pre-COVID levels? No, no, not in, not in the foreseeable future. I can't see how that is going to change, to be honest, from where we are right now. You talk about the trust quotient, but then, mm. of course, there's also the measurement of performance outcomes. Have we had enough time to understand whether productivity levels are in fact higher in this virtual hybrid space? Yeah, well, it depends on the nature of work you, uh, you're actually doing, right? So we know if it's transactional work, it is much easier uh, to do it in a quiet environment, right? Uh, that's why we have booths in call centers in order for someone not to actually lose focus and so on. So there's a lot of science in how a call center booth, for example, is designed, what people are looking at and so on. We know this, right? The le I mean, the less distraction you have, the more productivity you actually, um, we, you actually deliver on. So for me, if I look at that, then I think, yes, there is productivity. Has there been enough time to say, what are the long-term effects of actually working alone? No, uh, we have not done enough uh, work on that. Do I think like intu intuitively, not, not scientifically you know, proven that we must probably are gonna get more mental issues as a result of uh, COVID and people actually being on their own? Absolutely, absolutely. So what we as corporations and as companies should be actually gearing ourselves up for is being able to support on that side of the equation to say actually COVID comes with all these other stuff that are also um, that are also grey and sort of negative, right? In so there'll be more the focus on the well, more focus on the well-being of well -being. employees. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Then Yolanda, the other thing is head offices. Look at MTN's footprint. With now the new ways of work, there's a mm. lot of pressure on existing office space. For, mm. for leaders to say, hmm, do we need to relook our footprint? Do we need to reduce, reduce that cost line? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, COVID has actually given us an opportunity to reassess, right? To re-examine what we need is not just office space, it's other things as well, the way we work, the way we interact, and um, how office space is even designed, for example, right? Is it designed for what the output that you want? You know, we are still sitting on individual desks while we're actually saying we win in teams. So what does that actually mean? Where is the focus? Um, is hard desking going to be a, a big thing? Because no one needs permanent space uh, uh, in, in a hybrid work environment. So there is a whole lot of other things around it that we also need to get right. So I wouldn't call out one thing. I would say actually it's just multiple uh, things that we need to actually get right. How long do you think it's going to take for, for leaders to work their way through all of these different touch points to create, and I go back to this standard operating procedure when it comes to the new way of work, because that's effectively what we as executives living today 
are creating for all of the executives that follow. It's a standard operating procedure for a new life. Yeah, I think, I mean, um, I think the bold will get the first and the ones that are not scared of actually experimentation will get there first. You know, there are some people or some companies that will wait and see what others do and they will take longer, right? I mean, uh, my view on this, on this entire change is that we must just fall forward. That's it. I mean, there are things that we will get wrong. We actually have to be willing to pivot and do something different when we can see one thing is not working. So nothing is going to be perfect. I mean, as we actually uh, roll out the hybrid model, for example, for MTN, it is not necessarily going to be the, exactly the same for everybody, right? So, and how people experience it. There are people that will still prefer to be at the office Monday to Friday, right? Eight to six, eight to five, whatever it is. So you must allow that flexibility for people to be able to choose. And then we will actually reach that uh, happy medium in the long term. And in the long term doesn't mean in the next five years. I think we'll get there in the next uh, like year or two.